I always appreciate that um, people show up to these things. So regardless if I can see your face or not, it is lovely to know that you are. <laughs> um, it's interesting to also see now some people are joining us from office spaces and, and everybody is kind of going on their own journey uh, in somewhat in this process at the moment. So I welcome you from, from anywhere that you are sitting right now to join us for this conversation. Um, I have the honor today of being the moderator of this event. Um, I will throw out there, uh, this is probably the least um, confident I have felt about um, an event. Um, I probably shouldn't say that out loud. I think we're taught, as well, <laughs> you know, fake it till we make it. Um, and I'm just going to throw it out there and I'll explain a little bit more about why that's the case because you'll get a bit of a presentation from me on, on the land acknowledgement that I was um, honoured to ask to write and speak today. Um, but I'm also, I get the really wonderful job of introducing um, some of my TNC colleagues and the really great work that they've been doing and the really great topics that they're going to talk to you a bit more about this morning as well. So I'm going to start by briefly introducing themselves. They're all on uh, camera, so I'm just going to ask them to give a little wave, and then I'll give full introductions when we get round to their presentations, just so you can have a really good context of the work that they're doing. So uh, Maxine and Carol from North York Community House, give us a little wave. Nice to see you both. Um, and then we have Gabby and Aneda from the Waterfront Neighbourhood Centre, give us a little wave, both of you. Mm -hmm. you. And we also have Randall joining us from the Ontario Nonprofit Network. So give us a wave, Randall. Lovely, thank you. Um, we're going to hear some really great topics. So about uh, the work that they've been doing with each of their agencies that really connect with the truth and reconciliation work that we do as a collective with the TNR, TNR um, affinity. Um, I'm going to start though. I'm going to get my bit out of the way so we can move on to their their lovely words. Um, I'm just really going to talk to you through the my land acknowledgement um, and it is my land acknowledgement. I'm sure you heard there was a lot of personal content there and the process for going through that has been it kind of started when I came to Canada really four years ago. Um, I was very fortunate to have a friend at home who connected me with a friend who lives here so that I could make a friend uh, first of all um, and second of all that they were a very um, wise and passionate um, person uh, who genuinely made me realize that truth and reconciliation and the, um, the atrocities that have and still are being um, happening to indigenous peoples in Canada um, happened and are happening. Um, I really had no idea. We had a very interesting conversation about um, our educations um, and what I had learned in school and what they had been taught in school and really what the truth is. Um, so this is really a topic um, that I have been learning about for only a few years, which I now come to understand that this is actually the case for very many people, um, ev even in Canada. Um, and I also really am still learning to be comfortable with it which means I just have to be learned to be comfortable with being uncomfortable um, the this kind of process has just been ongoing really and I've really just taken to it in the way that I learn best which is predominantly for reading um, and then a lot of conversations with people um, when it's possible to you know kind of gauge their understanding on what it's what being indigenous means what um, what the nuances are, what, what the history is, what the um, discrimination looks like, um, who is Indigenous or what does it mean to them, uh, all, of, all of these, what is the, what is the culture, like, what is all of these questions that I think we all have that it's very difficult to kind of know where to start sometimes. So I started with books. I moved on to humans when I felt a little bit more comfortable and I was very lucky to have some spaces where people, particularly indigenous people, were open to kind of telling their stories. Um, 
I'm very lucky that my agency is connected to the Toronto Neighbourhood Centre, um, which is a beautiful collaboration of people trying to do the same thing that I am. And through them, I was able to hear um, from Talitha Tolls, um, from the Toronto Aboriginal Support Services Council, or TASC, um, her stories about what it means to be a strong, resilient Métis woman, um, and the work that she's done as an Indigenous rights activist, as a motivational speaker. And these were words literally from her LinkedIn, because I think she describes herself so beautifully. Um, and I think it's also important to recognise that we all have many parts to us that we bring to the table. The work that I do as local immigration partnership officer is sometimes um, is, is, is brilliant. I love it, but it can also sometimes be quite confusing to explain to people. So uh, excuse me if the um, rubbish trucks are going by outside a bit loud. Um, but yeah, it can be interesting because I'm based geographically in one location and connected to many, many others across Scarborough in the work to help newcomers settle better um, um, and, and be more integrated. Specifically around the, the topic of health is the area that I work on. But through that work, we, we're a partnership. We're a partnership, just not like the TNC, a partnership of agencies. And those agencies have been asking the LIP for the last um, probably year, maybe I would say, um, for us to partake in the work of Truth and Reconciliation. And we were fortunate enough that uh, Talifa joined our partnership and took us through a workshop, which is really what was the beginning of me writing the land acknowledgement that you heard earlier today. So that conversation, uh, I had previously before that been asked to write the land acknowledgement and I honestly was quite worried about that process. You know, what right do I have to, put my words into a land acknowledgement. Uh, what, what would I say? Do I even have any anything that, of importance to say? Um, but the truth is that once Talifa took us through this process, um, she, she tells stories and she tells stories about, you know, how she has been connected to the land, how she has been connected to her people. And, made me reflect on my own connection, similarly to the way that when Shri did her individual land acknowledgement, it made me realize that there is something I can empathize with um, when it comes to land, when it comes to connection to people, when it comes to permission to be here. Um, and I really did not expect to, to feel that, to understand that. Um, and what I, because really what I had done since I had come to this country was feel shame and chastised my ancestors um, for horrendous acts. Um, and so I felt very accountable for a very long time. But what all of these things have done, the reading, the talking, the listening, the being vulnerable enough to really try to connect my story to the story of others has given me the opportunity to think about the actions that I can take to make a difference for want of a better phrase it's a bit cliche but to make a difference um, and to, to take action and, and hopefully contribute to reconciliation which would feel, I guess, like a full circle process. But it's an everyday question, an everyday conversation with myself, which hasn't been consistent, certainly over the past few weeks. And thinking about writing that land acknowledgement, my, you know, my, pro my process and my involvement in that process has increased. Um, and so actually that action of writing the land acknowledgement has been incredibly powerful for this process. And now I'm at, you know, the next stage. Okay, what is next? What do I need to do to keep this process going? Um, I think we can all agree that stories are powerful. So that's definitely one thing I would take from this process. Um, and I think if we reflect that on the idea of land acknowledgements, you know, I'm incredibly grateful to anybody who's taken the time to 
to have a, a land acknowledgement at an event that I've gone to because it's been part of my learning journey in, um, in reconciliation. And I realize I am centering this all on, on me and my experience, but I think that's something that we have to do at, at some point, you know, we have to connect ourselves to, to this process. Um, but the, I think we all as a collective could, could probably agree that land acknowledgements have become a bit of a rote process. Um, and so now what can we do to move to the next stage? How can we use our stories to move forward? Um, and I, I would, you know, if anybody is out there considering using land acknowledgements, um, I would open myself up to um, talking to you one-on-one -on -one about what this process has meant um, and helping you to write your own, honestly, because it's um, been very, very powerful for me. Um, yeah, so that's that's me. That's the land acknowledgement for today. That's uh, that process. And um, now we get to move on to some other wonderful actions that um, different agencies have taken. Um, and I would love to introduce to you Carol, Shan uh, Carol Shantanada and Maxine McCoy from North York Community House. So to introduce them, North York Community House is a dynamic multi-service neighborhood center that has been working with residents in under-resourced and low-income neighborhoods of Northwest Toronto for 30 years. Uh, known as Niche, is committed to building strong, vibrant communities by engaging residents, understanding their needs and supporting them in achieving their goals. As a result of their work, newcomers are able to develop the skills, knowledge and connections to settle, gain employment and build successful lives in their new home. Children and youth are supported in becoming active, healthy citizens, gaining the skills, knowledge and self-esteem they require to meet their long-term goals. And local residents are provided with training and opportunities to enable them to become leaders, in improving their own lives and their neighbourhoods. Niche believes that all the community members they serve have the strength and ability to meet their goals. Their role is to help them get there. there. So I welcome to the floor. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Isabel, for the introduction. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Carol. And Maxine? Yeah, okay. So Maxine will, will pop in as well. Um, so um, for a few years now at Niche, we have been working on deepening our knowledge and understanding of Indigenous peoples, both within the organization and in the communities. Uh, that we serve uh, through conversations, training, and workshops. So in 2018, we formed a Truth and Reconciliation work group uh, to raise awareness, explore opportunities for allyship, and develop strategies to embed truth and reconciliation work into our programs and policies. So practically, what the way we did this was that one of the managers uh, who worked with us at the time essentially took the lead and invited staff um, who were interested to join a lunch and learn uh, where she presented the TRC's call to actions, uh, call to action and the work done uh, up until that time at Niche. So we also talked about our own understanding um, and experience of indigenous people or our relationship with indigenous people in Canada but also our connections with indigenous people from our own countries. Many of us at the organization um, are newcomers and immigrants ourselves. Uh, so we acknowledged that we needed to learn more and explore our relationship with indigenous people as modern day settlers. Many of us come from colonized countries and while we might have been colonized back home, we had to confront our new identity and see how our settling on these lands was adding another layer of oppression on indigenous people. So it was important for us as staff, as newcomers, uh, to be open and listen and learn. So from this discussion, we decided to create a work group and later a committee to do more consistent and focused work. Hello everyone, my name is Maxine. 
I'm the volunteer program manager at North York Community House. I joined the TNR committee in the fall of two, um, 2018 um, because I was interested in, learn, in learning about indigenous issues and the committee offered an opportunity for learning and understanding the meaning of allyship. The other thing for me as well, I realized that I had no connection, no relationship with um, anyone in the indigenous community. And so it was an opportunity to try and build um, some connections and relationships. Um, many of the committee members um, at the table came with the same attitude of wanting to learn and engage. The committee encouraged participation from all the different programs within NICHE um, in order for every program to have that learning embedded in the work that they, um, we were doing. So one of the first agenda items for the committee was to create a work plan and a list of commitments we wanted to be able to accomplish. So we will share our work plan in the chat with you um, later on, but uh, we are going to talk a little bit about it. So one of the things that helped us was that St. Stephen's Community House shared their work plan with us. So that gave us a bit of a start uh, to work on our own. So we looked at truth activities and reconciliation activities and put down some things that we thought we should work on. So Maxine and I will speak briefly about some of the goals from the work plan uh, that we were able to meet and some that are still in progress. So one of our goals was training for staff. Niche committed to two agency-wide trainings per year focused on indigenous awareness, learning, cultural sensitivity, history, and knowledge, with at least one training facilitated by an indigenous person or elder. One of which was our first training, one of our first training was on treaties with indigenous activist and teacher, Sandra LaFleur. She also assisted us in creating our land acknowledgement. We also wanted to embed short, short, sorry, we wanted, also wanted to embed some training or learning sessions on truth and reconciliation and indigenous dedication at our all staff meetings. Um, these have led to very interesting discussions and ideas that um, we took back to the committee uh, and plan and working on. Uh, another goal was training and awareness for community. So we, in our work plan, we said we would commit to one community event um, per year, um, but we realized that we could also embed um, indigenous learning and practice into the events that we already had. So we have invited, um, and we try to invite at now for our events, uh, indigenous elders and organizations to participate in our community events. So for example, at our family day celebrations, Ojibwe Indigenous Cultural Network shared teachings about indigenous medicine and facilitated arts and crafts activities for the community. Uh, this year, Simon McNichol, who is the Aboriginal program worker at West Neighborhood House, performed a smudging ceremony and shared teachings and prayer. That was a, it was a really beautiful um, ceremony, but also it also connected up to some of, uh, some of the traditions that many of us um, also had in, in our own cultures. Um, and Michael Sina, residential school survivor and indigenous knowledge keeper, uh, performed a traditional indigenous welcoming ceremony at an event that we did for a couple of years called Once Upon a Refugee which is a community education event celebration, celebrating the experience and contributions of refugees. So this was a really interesting, interesting connection to make because it brought together two communities who experienced great loss and who've either been displaced from their land or had lands taken away from them. Um, the staff have also been incorporating indigenous education into our programming in, in various ways. Um, the language instruction for newcomers, which is the LINK program, uh, the teachers and the childcare team include indigenous learning activities and stories into their curriculum, as well as celebrate indigenous commemorative and awareness days. 
um, through the citizenship preparation program, we focus um, on a more comprehensive understanding of Canadian history that includes the history of indigenous peoples and goes a little beyond the material um, that is already provided. Um, there isn't very much there in the citizenship uh, preparation. Uh, and our newly launched Canada Connects program, uh, we have conversations with newcomers and sessions about present day complexities um, and as well as shared history. Uh, another interesting uh, thing that the Civic Democracy Youth and Refugee Programs have been exploring is a shared history and experience of colonization that many newcomers have with indigenous peoples, as well as looking at how we can challenge the attitudes that perpetuate the oppression of communities. Another way that we've been uh, raising awareness um, is working with our, <clears throat> excuse me, working with our newcomer students in our LINK program. So um, wanting to share inf information on Indigenous peoples. So we've looked at how we can communicate that information. So we've done it with videos um, in terms of very short videos showing different um, cultural aspects. Um, some of the videos we have used are videos on language. Um, so we looked at a video um, which talked about a community trying to relearn their language. And so the Link students were able to relate to that. We also did some um, movie events um, for staff as well as our participants. And after the movies, we'd have discussions on, on the movie itself. So we, the movies we saw were Smoke Signals and Kayat to Clem 2. And at our open house events, we would have video activities. We would have some indigenous art. We would have, as Carol mentioned, the smudging ceremony. And so we created a space for discussion. So folks who had questions, or, or um, wanted to share about their own experiences could have that space to be able to do so. So another of our goal is around orientation and training for new staff because we want to create a truth and reconciliation and, and indigenous education training components to the orientation for new staff. And so one of the things that we, that's a work in progress, we're still working and creating that. But one of the things that we have done, we have encouraged our new staff to, to find and participate in blanket exercises. Um, these exercises teach the history of indigenous peoples in Canada. We also have our internal communications platform. And with that platform, we have created different resources for staff to be able to go to, to find, find information and truth and reconciliation in it and indigenous education. So with reconciliation activities, um, uh, one of the things that was important that was to look at the governance um, and you know, management and board and the board's um, involvement. So some of that we um, still have some work to do on, but uh, one of the things that we did want, that we were able to sort of work through is the creative we wanted to create value statements of commitment to truth and reconciliation and indigenous learning for NIT um, overall. So um, we have included a value statement and committed uh, commitment both in our hiring communications and in our email signatures. So that is now becoming a part um, of our policy and all our communications. Um, yeah, okay. So the other goal that we had was to, we wanted to ensure that we had our land acknowledgement at all our niche locations. So currently we do have our land acknowledgement post at our new location, which is at Lawrence and Allen Road. Um, due to the lockdown, we <laughs> didn't get around to post then at the others at our other four locations, but that is something that we will be doing when we return to our office space. Um, so we, that was our goal. We also wanted to have um, indig indigenous art and posters at our location. And we're looking at creating a library for link students. And um, so wanting to bring in books and um, different information so that 
the students can start learning and also provide some children's book for the child care program. So um, the children themselves can start learning about indigenous um, culture. We, um, in order to provide more support to staff around being able to do a land acknowledgement at programs or activities, we did a road show so where we went to different different teams and spoke about our own personal experience in drafting the land acknowledgement and wanting to hear about staff, uh, how they felt and how they would feel about doing land acknowledgement at their programs. Um, it was very successful. We got a lot of great feedback. Um, we heard a lot of um, concerns, anxieties around it and um, which is totally understandable because um, similar to what Isabel shared, a lot of folks were feeling their own insecurity or their own um, sense of being an oppressor. And so it was basically talking through that and helping folks to, to come to some understanding and some learning. And, um, it still is something that we're working on, but it was something that staff found meaningful because it was it allowed them a space to be able to express some of the things they were feeling. Um, so the, when we share the um, our work plan with you, you will see that there are areas of policy and partner um, partnership and HR that we are still sort of working on. Um, so some of the activities are either in progress or sort of need approval because they have to go up to the board or to senior management. And um, since this is something that staff uh, are doing in addition to their program uh, uh, and team responsibilities, uh, things do move a little slowly. Um, but uh, we keep moving forward and we can see that there are some great opportunities, especially with the kind of work we do and the access we have um, to really um, um, take this work forward. So thank you for having us. Thank you. That's wonderful. Thank you, Maxine and Carol. It was really great to hear about the really quite considered and thoughtful and ongoing process that um, Niche and yourselves and part of the committee as part of the committee have been going through. So Thank you so much for kind of spelling that out for, for, for us, because I think oftentimes we can see that, you know, agencies and people are, are, are succeeding and it makes it all the more easier for us all to succeed if we can see how that happens. So that was a really great way of kind of spelling that out for us. Um, folks, if anybody in the group has questions, I just wanted to highlight, if you have them, feel free to hold on to them. We're going to open up for questions in a bit after all presentations. Also feel free to put them in the chat if you want to kind of help mull them over. Um, but we will come back to questions for each of the individual presenters or perhaps, you know, just as overall, uh, once we've had all of the presentations. Okay, so our next presentation is from uh, staff from the Waterfront Neighbourhood Centre. So we have Gabby Mota, uh, Community Development Manager um, and Seniors Programs, and Aneda Guerra, the Supervisor of Children's and Family Programs. Waterfront Neighbourhood Centre, formerly Harbourfront Community Centre, is a non-profit City of Toronto AOCC agency that is supported by a volunteer board of dedicated community members. We, they work in a partnership with residents and community-minded organisations to create a safe and supportive environment for people of all ages. Their waterfront community is the fastest growing vertical neighbourhood in the city. Their programmes mirror their community as the demand for family, children, community outreach and senior programmes are on the rise. By engaging the community, they ensure that WNC's activities meet the growing and diverse needs of their neighbourhood now and in the future. So welcome to Gabby and Anada. Please take the floor. Hi everyone, my name is Anita and I'm the Supervisor of Children and Family Programs at the Waterfront Neighborhood Center. 
Um, and today we're going to talk about how we've integrated um, Indigenous content into our programming across all departments, including children, family, youth and adults, and seniors as well. Um, the integration of in traditional Indigenous teachings and learnings to our programs has provided valuable experiences while creating awareness uh, for many of our community members. Um, and we feel that it is our obligation and um, we take great pleasure in, in making sure that we're providing those teachings and uh, um, ensuring that we're also providing an inclusive environment and making everyone feel welcome. Um, and also while continuing to history um, as well. I'll start off by talking about you know the way we've integrated our um, the Indigenous content in our programs. Uh, so we've started off by also holding trainings and uh, presentations um, with our staff because we feel that um, you know given that they're facilitating the programs that you know, in order for them to feel connected in some way, they also need to fully understand, um, you know, the Indigenous history um, and truth and reconciliation and, and, and how to do that. Um, and so we've provided uh, trainings that include, um, you know, conversation pieces, case studies. We've also um, provided uh, opportunities to watch um, Indigenous documentaries. Um, as well, we've gone through um, conversations about the Indian Act. Um, we were actually just recently looking at um, Bob Joseph's book. Um, he's an author, and an Indigenous author, um, that um, talked about the 21 things that the Indian Act covers, and um, it was a great way to to discuss, you know, the oppression that the Indigenous communities have been um, experiencing over these years, and the colonization as well. Um, and this gave an opportunity for staff to engage in conversation and discuss different perspectives on their understandings um, of, of the Indigenous communities um, and also to, to provide them with knowledge um, and further, further experiential learning. Um, and so these, these trainings that we provide are, remain ongoing. Um, throughout the year. We also allow staff the opportunity to, to request um, you know, further training, such as cultural competency trainings with the city, um, while also um, providing you know, um, opportunities to join different uh, affinity groups, whether it's from TNR, um, such as TNR, um, but also um, you know, just bridging the gap with with trying to engage with other partnered organizations and having um, workshops uh, within the program space and also for, for staff. Um, so as part of training, we've also discussed programming and the importance of incorporating um, Indigenous content. So that means, um, you know, purchasing, creating a safe space and a welcoming environment that includes uh, books that introduce Indigenous teachings for, uh, for children and families, um, allowing them the opportunity to also engage in conversation. So we would have, um, you know, circle times and read, um, you know, books about Indigenous communities and then have conversation pieces after uh, with family members. We would also encourage you know, one-to-one um, conversations between the parent and the child and then engage in um, interactive activities, whether it's an arts and crafts activity or a reading comprehension or um, just um, playful um, activities as well. So we would have um, equipment and supplies uh, to support that. So we would also encourage uh, drumming experiences, um, music and dance uh, within programs, anything that was you know, considered age appropriate as well for, for children and families. Um, we um, also held um, a lot of cultural events um, that focus on Indigenous communities. Um, we would celebrate Indigenous Peoples Days and, and try to reach out to community members of indigenous communities to participate um, in these events as well. Um, 
we've um, incorporated a lot of uh, arts and crafts activities that have been facilitated by parents of Indigenous communities. Um, so we've um, tried to engage them in a way that you know, allows them to, to also share their knowledge and experiences um, through facilitating various workshops and um, sharing their stories as well um, to families and children within the programs. Um, so we've had, um, you know, parents come in and, and uh, you know, do dream catchers, create dream catchers with children, and um, I know it sounds um, cliche, but they've, they've done, uh, they've provided a range of, of activities um, for families, um, including um, arts and crafts activities and drumming. And, and um, we've also made sure that, um, you know, as part of, of the collaboration, we try to engage um, staff and participants in arts festivals. So for example, um, last summer, um, well, over the summers at, at Fort York, they've celebrated indigenous cultural events. Um, and we've, um, you know, put together scavenger hunts where the staff and the participants can engage and collaborate um, together and, um, you know, just have fun um, in the midst of, of, of learning and appreciating um, the Indigenous culture and creating awareness. Um, and uh, I mean, this is an ongoing process. We, we're no experts. We're continuing to learn and grow. Um, and at this point, we're, we're looking into um, further engagement, um, you know, with the community and making sure that we're also reaching out to, to Indigenous um, community members as well that can help facilitate this process and, um, and create further awareness while trying to engage all of, all of the age groups and um, uh, community members that we serve. Yeah. Kathy? Yes. So, hi everyone. Uh, my, my name is Gabby. Um, I have been working here for a while at the Waterfront Neighborhood Center and was fortunate to experience uh, the different changes that has happened in the community. Now, uh, myself, um, as part of the, initially of the family uh, programs team, uh, and seniors at the beginning of my work with Waterfront Neighborhood Center, I had the, the opportunity to meet many uh, community members, uh, many uh, community leaders, local champions that wanted to do some work in some areas uh, personally, I consider myself, and I had had difficult conversations about it with friends uh, that come from Peru as myself. I consider myself as being uh, uh, of mixed background and um, native Peruvian. Um, I had seen like a many uh, of you or the many of the people that we work with as being ostracized by, um, by others, but uh, by others population groups. And we had to overcome barriers there and here. So I was fortunate to have uh, great role models as my mother, a very strong woman my her brother, who from very early age instilled of us the love for our culture. And uh, we were involved in promoting the culture through uh, the, being part of local uh, associations, local organizations of the Andean place where I was born. Um, and we promoted through music, dance, storytelling, uh, presentations. Then later on, I was able to involve in a women's grassroots organization. Uh, so now my aunt was the leader for me, always had been. Uh, 
Uh, she did pass away last year. And with this women's organization that was created with the textile workers of one of the oppressed um, fabrics or um, factories in Peru, uh, a great uh, organization was created that work on women's empowerment, mostly uh, within the indigenous women's children and their families. So uh, uh, tons of work on health promotion activities, literacy activities that was very important so women can, as they are the leaders of their own houses and communities, can work and develop themselves further for a better quality of life for themselves, themselves and for their children. So um, we had uh, literacy programs, health promotion programs, so women can help themselves to survive, help with the economy of the house, of the community. Uh, there were also many other opportunities for capacity building of these uh, communities. Uh, we had seen many youth being uh, sent to other countries uh, for, with the scholarships to further their education. I was one of them. I was lucky enough. Um, so uh, my aunt was very indigenous. Uh, she was oppressed for that. She almost couldn't, um, wasn't allowed to participate uh, in, in a surgeon association or to further her education as a, as a doctor. Um, so I'm very empowered by her, and when coming to Canada, uh, it was an eye-opening for me. Uh, I felt, as many of, of, of us, of you, that I was taking a space that didn't belong to me. Um, I was fortunate to work with some Native women, one of them a uh, former placement student, from George Rand College, Marion Kelly, who did a few workshops for us on medicine will. Um, it was something different for me. It, it was, I felt like it was easy to talk to. It was, it's almost like it, when you are sitting down with the indigenous communities, you feel, you feel the pain and you feel uh, the lack of respect and oppression that they had, been go they had been going through all these communities. At the same time, I feel empowered that I had the honor to meet uh, people um, that were able to help us with many activities at the Harborfront Community Center and then Waterfront Neighborhood Center. Um, most of activities of our activities have been related to um, International Women's Day events. Though it wasn't one event, however, our, um, the storytelling, the Aboriginal ceremony in Smajin took an hour. So, and we were able to reach hundreds of people. Uh, since um, 2008, um, we had um, Mrs. Dolma Tessering, an activist, uh, grandmother of, initially of the Parkdale Women's Association founder as well. Uh, later on, she belonged to the International 13 Indigenous Grandmothers Council that was able to travel around the world, a group composed of different indigenous women from Japan, Brazil, New Zealand, uh, the States, uh, including our own Canadian, Tibetan, um, powerful grandmother. They have great achievements. They were able to open many um, conferences, including environment conferences. Uh, that was 2008. In 2016, we had a beautiful, beautiful because of the content and for everything else, of um, the center's open house and showcase of our programs. 
uh, we had the pleasure to work with uh, a coordinator of a George Brown College. Uh, later on, I'll be sending all the names because I don't want to miss anyone. Uh, her name, Nancy. She uh, participated not only at the open house, but in the in the subsequent uh, International Women's Day with more than 160 people, including women, children, uh, their spouses, and, and, and our youth uh, working together and talking about the grassroots women's movements and the fights that uh, indigenous communities and women have to still do. Some of, uh, of uh, our other work uh, recently had included um, uh, during COVID-19, we had to work more virtually. So in my department, uh, Community Development and Seniors, we had done, uh, brought a big awareness of uh, Indigenous Peoples Month and Day, and National Day, um, by uh, putting together a video for a YouTube channel on uh, this commemoration of the struggle of indigenous communities and all the achievements as well. We couldn't be here in Canada if not for indigenous people's fight and survival at the same time that continues, uh, continues uh, to teach us many, many things. We're better if we work with them, if we take in into our soul, into our work, their teachings. So we had, uh, through food in the community kitchen program and the YouTube channel, we had the three, uh, three sister soup. We had bannock uh, breads. Um, we also put a small glossary just to understand some of the terminology that was used um, during the cooking session. Uh, we have, uh, so far, uh, we believe we have more than 450 views just for that, um, that YouTube session. Um, along like the other centers had said, we, have, we make sure that we have our posters, our flyers. Um, one area that we haven't worked yet, but I believe we are all very passionate and with all our team uh, here at Waterfront, we will do our own land of acknowledgement. It is something very powerful to work with. Uh, on, to work, we had a couple of students working just before COVID, unable to complete the land of acknowledgement. Uh, we were looking at cities. Thank you for sharing. Now, um, I can mention as well that um, because most of the staff, and I believe we are all kind of a new immigrants, even though we had been, or we will be considered forever new immigrants, even though we have been here for 30 years or five years. Um, we, I lost track of my words, <laughs> but anyways, as, as newcomers or immigrants from different communities, we have we have been able to share with the community at the waterfront since its beginning, um, the indigenous Andean music from South America. At the request of our leaders here, uh, and also uh, because of our own interest in sharing and learning together with the community. Um, we also had, um, are, are working with the Toronto Community Housing Buildings, uh, community leaders, housing co-ops, and parks association in the areas. Some of them have indigenous committees. Some of them, especially the housing co-ops, had gone through the blanket exercise training for their uh, residents co-presidents. Uh, I know that one of the goals that Waterfront Neighborhood Center wants to achieve uh, after the great two blanket exercises that we had at the center last year and also at the last summer camp just a couple of months ago, the last summer camp staff training where we dissected, Anita <laughs> dissected the Indian Act. Um, 
we uh, are going to continue to move forward towards uh, learning uh, indigenous teaching uh, and sharing with community members through community training. So we want this time to include our community members and local champions in indigenous trainings. Uh, it will require some time. Sometimes partnerships uh, are a bit difficult. It takes a bit longer to, to establish uh, great partnerships. However, we have already some done some work with, uh, for example, the Native um, Centre of Toronto, uh, who has uh, engaged with us by um, sharing their story storytellers, their cultural educators, um, their workers um, in our different um, International Women's Day or programs sessions. So as well, we have uh, working with other organizations. There is a 74-year-old uh, grandmother who called me last night and I felt very empowered by just hearing her when I told her we need to speak about our work with indigenous communities. She told me, don't forget to mention our organization. She's an amazing grandmother who has been working with, indig with indigenous peoples at the UN, attending and actively, mostly actively participating with uh, at the UN sessions and bringing um, innovative ideas as uh, the 2015 uh, indigenous sports in Brazil for the first time put by one of her ideas to put together by, by the UN in Brazil. So uh, she said to me, uh, we have to defend, promote indigenous communities, indigenous cultures, the environment, including f animals, fauna, for everybody's, everyone's survival. Not only indigenous communities, but everyone's survival. We're going to we're going through toughest times. At the same time, now we're able to recognize our uh, the things that we need to work more on. We recognize the racism that we we all face in Canada for all one on one way or another. But we need to work together. So on that note, I'm sure <laughs> there's more to say. But I'll leave back the mic to Isabel or Siri. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Leda. That was really helpful. Um, it's also, I mean, yeah, your story is stories and, and you share stories of other people as well. And that's incredibly powerful. And it really helps us to kind of, I think, appreciate some of the words and the terminology that we we want to learn because it helps us to talk about these topics but um, these stories and and the work that you're doing really help us to understand you know why we're doing it so thank you very much for that um okay so we have one more presenter um um, I can see that there have been some questions in the chat and then once we have our next presenter we're going to move on to um, those questions so keep them coming in if we have answers we'll have answers for you but for now we are going to move on to our third um, third slash fourth uh, presenter um, and that's Randall Tarada. Um, Randall works uh, on decent work in the nonprofit sector. He's the project lead and he works for the Ontario Nonprofit Network, which works to create a public policy environment that allows nonprofits to thrive. They engage their network of diverse nonprofit organizations across Ontario to work together on issues affecting the sector and channel the voices of their network to governments, funders, and stakeholders. So, Randall, I welcome you to the floor. Thank you very much. And uh... I just want to thank Sri and TNC for inviting me today to speak on this topic. Um, so Sri, um, will you be able to share your screen or the... Okay, that's great. 
Okay. Um, so I just, uh, just want to change gears for just a slight instance. Um, the Decent Work Project, um, I believe, uh, it dovetails well with TRC um, in many ways, as you, as you will see. And not the least, um, because Decent Work, um, it shares the spiritual values of, of Indigenous organizations. So I, I guess the main message that I want to share with you today is for all of you out there, uh, share your decent work journey under your TRC work, because much of your TRC work and outreach is decent work through the values you're promoting, through, for instance, equitable hiring practices, um, you know, and collaborative work with new partners, and your renewed emphasis on community care. Um, so let's really think widely and broadly about how we can incorporate a lot of uh, the work we're doing in a s sort of sharing those same spiritual values that we'll see coming out of, uh, out of our work um, with, with uh, Indigenous organizations. Now, uh, ne next slide, please. Uh, so why is strength in decent work nonprofit sector important? I'll answer that question with a question. Why is strengthening decent work in nonprofit sector important? And I hopefully let's look at that answer through an indigenous lens. Um, next slide. But before we get there, I think like this next slide speaks to all of us and in all of our sort of our recognition of why um, our work with TRC is important. Um, Passion led us, many of us, to this work in the nonprofit sector, but uh, which is great, but passion can't pay the rent and it can't pay us monthly checks sort of in our retirement. So nonprofit work, nonprofit workers, uh, we have to keep this in mind as we move forward. The next slide. And this was sort of some of the animating questions, research okay. questions that promoted this um, work from the Toronto Aboriginal Social Support Council. Um, perspectives on decent work from Indigenous support services. And uh, the acronym TASC is, they're a, sort of a, they're not for, not for profit organization. Um, they do policy and advocacy. Their base starting point are the social de determinants of health. They use that to improve sort of the enhance the life opportunities and, and social economic prospects of, you know, of uh, culture and the well-being of, uh, of the urban indigenous living in the city of Toronto. And some of the organizations that participate in this survey, Native Women Center, Resource Center, Toronto Council File, uh, Council File, Fire, sorry, Aboriginal Legal Services, and a number of others, Wigwaman, uh, Nishnabi Homes. Uh, next slide, please. So what they were looking at, um, local Indigenous orgs are some of the Toronto's largest employers of Indigenous peoples, okay? Coupled with the fact that the vast majority of those urban Indigenous people live below the poverty line. So employers then, um, by providing the safe, healthy workplaces, that's very important for the social and economic support of many Indigenous workers. So next slide. And this is, this is the animating sort of uh, key piece that uh, we need to keep in mind about when we're working with Indigenous organizations. Because the key piece here is that living on Turtle Line for 15,000 years, wage labor. So whenever we reach out, seek to partner, seek to work with mm -hmm. Aboriginal people, um, we have to remember that our way of working, our whole paradigm, of the way we approach our work, do our work, get paid for our work, is a colonial imposition on Indigenous peoples. They were living very well sustainably on the land before the appearance of European colonizers. And so 
um, this imposition was traumatic occurrence. And we're going to see the out, some, some of the um, effects of that trauma on, on the Indigenous workers in these Indigenous organizations. But we need to keep in mind that um, they were doing decent work in a way, quote unquote, um, long before the concept was invented. So working with Indigenous organizations, um, when we work with them, when we reach out to them, the work needs to be untaken, not as sort of a, not as a market-based transactional occurrence. That mm -hmm. may be our bias, may be our assumption, but rather we should take the opportunity to learn about, the, about um, their notion of relationality. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, next slide, please. So defining decent work from the Indigenous staff, and this is um, from their survey. This is what uh, the Indigenous staff um, brought up, uh, cited as some of their ideas of what decent work in their organizations would mean. Um, so we have their mental, physical, you know, spiritual well-being, physical supports, especially in times today of such incredible uncertainty, I think um, th these are very important. These are some of the practices they cite. Next slide, please. Um, they cite, uh, of course, from the previous slide, uh, again, less hierarchical structures, more relational, more feedback, more supports. And of course, they cite fair income. We also have, now here's, a very interesting point. Um, like willing to accept less money for more cultural awareness, cultural mm. service for Indigenous organizations. Um, my only question here would be, is that necessarily a trade-off though? Is it neither or for that one? But the importance underscores here of this slide is for Indigenous organizations, culture, culture, culture. Mm -hmm. It's a determining factor in how we do our jobs. And not just in, in terms of um, um, the Indigenous workforce, but when we, we look at our own, our, our own workforces in our own organizations and in the communities we serve, the incredible diversity um, and, 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 the, some, and some of the sort of the uh, biases, assumptions we bring to our work that negates the culture, um, the cultural background of our co-workers and of the communities that we're working with. Uh, so I, um, I really want to highlight that point that came out of this, this survey as well. Um, and let's talk about the elephant in the room, the correlation between a really good uh, supportive workspace and uh, collective bargaining agreements. Could probably have that. Um, that could be uh, another another conversation altogether, or in the in the breakout room. Uh, next, please, side, please. Uh, so the survey analysis revealed areas of interest. Um, so this is the big buckets: training, growth opportunities, safe environment, uh, flexible work hours could even be working from home, and cost of living increases. So this is what came out in. And what the task emphasizes though, when they were trying to um, try to uh, put these into practices and talk with the organizations of how, what the next steps are. Uh, next slide, please. Timeline is all important. Um, remember everyone's, and they recognize that every indigenous serving Indigenous-led organization was on a, on a very different continuum when it came to decent work. Some were already doing many of the practices, didn't know it, didn't even label it as such, but some were on a much longer continuum to, to put these practices in place. And so there's, there's a timeline that um, where everyone is on a different place on that timeline, which is fine, and they take um, they, they take that in consideration from six months to a year to over a year. Uh, next slide, please. And then quickly, here are their commitments. Um, here's what they committed to a lot of the senior leaders. Um, once they got their, the survey 
back and they had more discussion were some of the, um, and I'll let you read them over, um, largely not too surprising. Next slide, please. Mentorship opportunities, cost of living, always important, and transparency. Transparency, I believe, is um, uh, for my, my work, that's a generational thing. I think a lot of the younger workers want greater transparency, uh, less hierarchy on a lot of the issues that affect them as a staff. So that too is uh, quite universal. Next slide, please. Thanks. Training and growth opportunities for the young workers that builds on the skill sets and increases future employability. Another issue that arose is um, having accommodations. And this is, um, you could put under the, uh, I like to put on the rubric of, of uh, colonial, colonial assumptions, white supremacy assumptions, but our reliance on certification, paid certifications, educational certifications, when we put them in our, 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 um, our job requests, they cite that uh, the support of those with lived experience is crucial and providing training and growth opportunities when you hire from lived experience from the community, uh, very important in that spirit. Um, and next slide, please. Thanks. And of course, none of this, and I, I really value this mention in their report is that, of course, our work in TRC, our work with decent work, cannot be undertaken without senior leaders, boards, discussing with funders, with foundations. And now's the time, as we all no doubt know, foundations are moving um, with COVID has opened up opportunities to have new conversations with funders because they have, and with, the, and with certain precedents of how fast the government moved on certain, um, served for one thing, on, on certain of the opportunities that could benefit uh, the nonprofit sector overall. But uh, funders definitely play a huge role and those conversations have to happen. And the um, task and uh, what, what they got back from the survey is they underscored the importance of, yes, of uh, funding and resources to resource your work in TRC is, uh, is crucial. And I could just add as a sidebar, my work at ONN, where I, we're moving out and taking this opportunity to strike up those conversations with funders as well, overall about the importance of decent work and nonprofit organizations. And I reach out to many of you now listening um, to shoot me an email um, if you want to participate in some of those discussions because we always know that narratives, that stories, stories about what you wanna do with TRC in your organization, what plans do you have moving forward to reach out and amplify indigen uh, indigenous voices? We would love those stories and relate those stories in person to a funder's table to say, um, this is what we need, this is what the nonprofit needs, and, and most importantly, this is what society is embarking on, and we can't be left behind. Nonprofit organizations have to show the relevancy here. Um, and that's. Uh, that's one reason why um, we underscore always the importance of, of, of funders. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and leading the future, young indigenous organizations uh, right now, they're really truly looking for wider supports in terms of collaborations, collaborative partnerships and um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm looking out to, to your organizations. Um, I think, I think um, the time is now. Purchase of services, um, collaborative funding with those organizations. Um, and even in, in some of, of the ways, uh, workshops, what, what came out, of, and I, I mentioned it just previously, briefly, but indigenous ways of knowing to combat our colonial settler bias in the way we do our work, our white supremacy. 
we need to engage more in alternative ways of knowing, indigenous ways of knowing, relationality rather than transactionality. Uh, the medicine wheel emphasizes different attachments to, to our bodily being in ways, different ways of navigating our spaces, you know, um, on this earth, different ways of navigating, you know, on this earth intellectually, emotionally, physically, even spiritually are really important ways. So, um, so when you reach out for new workshops, I think that too. At ONN, we're looking, as um, I, I heard on a number of, of speakers before me, um, the next steps past the, you know, the, the blanket workshop, and we're looking at um, different ways of um, engaging our TRC um, in the next step, and, and one would be in terms of um, engaging in ways that we can offset our certain colonial biases in the way we intellectually approach approach our work. Um, and that's one thing we're looking at. We're looking at, you can look at ways to amplify Indigenous voices by, um, um, by attaching your decent work practices, um, you know, with Indigenous values, and then co-presenting your work with, with the Indigenous organizations that you worked with, you know. Um, these are just some ideas that, I, that just pop to mind about the way organizations can move forward under a sort of a TRC, Decent Work Rubric. Uh, next slide, please, Rick. So it's happening uh, now more than ever. And I don't need to tell any of you this, but young people want to do this work. TRC, Black Lives Matter, um, mm -hmm. um, Indigenous Voices, climate change, they're on the radar. So let's make sure in our work, we reflect what's important sort of for sustaining, you know, safe and healthy communities. So I just want to thank you on that. So thanks. Thanks, Sri. Thank you very much, Randall. Um, I think that was such a great perspective to be able to hear from you uh, and the work of the ONN, particularly given that like you have such a, a, a kind of broad approach to, to, to understanding and learning and, and action and how we can move forward. Um, and it's really embedded as well um, in the voices of the Indigenous peoples that have been surveyed as well. So um, what a great example of, of a resource that we can kind of hear about and, and think about as we move forward in our action as well. Um, a really great range, a really great range of speakers that we've heard from this morning. Um, I'm really um, very honoured to have heard from all of you. Um, so thank you, Randall, and thank you, um, um, the others as well.